Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is our, I, I just lose count every time. It's okay. I think 11th, 10th okay. or 11th episode. And we are discussing. 10th essay, 11th discussion. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Essay uh, equals episode plus one <laughs> or minus one. So essay number 10, which is titled, What is Living and What is Dead in Croce's Criticism of Vico? So uh, as John said, before we started recording, this is like a three-layered presentation. We are talking about Hayden White's discussion of Benedetto uh, Croce's uh, criticism of uh, Giambattista Vico's The New Science. So those three layers give us uh, at least two options, two pathways into the chapter. We can, on the one hand, talk about uh, the, the topic at hand, which is uh, maybe uh, the, the distinction between laws of history, the laws of social sciences, to the extent to which social phenomena, historical phenomena are open to um, a kind of description that regards them as lawful, as uh, reg regular enough that they are kind of open up a way um, of a kind of scientific uh, investigation. And that, so the distinction has lawful um, scientific approach. On the one hand, on the other hand, we have historical phenomena as totally, absolutely singular, particular. You cannot generalize based on them. So that is part of the, what is at the heart of the debate uh, or the, the tension, the conflict. Uh, so we have Crochet who has very deep admiration and respect and he's inspired by Vico, and, uh, but his inspiration and respect is mixed with criticism. Mm -hmm. um, and so that another, that's another topic we can get into, the, the nature of criticism the, this kind of mixed feelings in, in relation to the master, somebody who really inspires you. And then we can regard, we can uh, approach the situation from Vico's perspective. We can say, oh, is it good for Vico? Is it beneficial to have a kind of follower who um, distorts you to the, in, this, in this way? Or not, not necessarily distorts you, but kind of puts their own uh, frame. Um, Hayden White says at one point that uh, Vico is being judged and evaluated uh, not in uh, he, on his own terms, but uh, against the measure that is Croce's perfect version of philosophy. So he has his own system, and then he judges the master against his own perfect version of uh, uh, theory of history. All right, I'll stop there. Uh, maybe it's time. <laughs> I don't want... first. Okay, sure. Um, I thought... Um, about two things when I was reading this. Um, one of them was George Steiner's book called Lessons of the Master, which is a, a series of essays that George Steiner, the um, recently deceased European literary critic, wrote about um, teachers and their influences on their students mm -hmm. and how, how that teacher-student uh, bond can take so many different um, shapes, paths, um, cut kinds of influence, types of influence. I think he might talk about um, uh, maybe like Plato and Aristotle, uh, and maybe um, oh goodness, um, uh, Heidegger and Hannah Arendt, you know, just to give you two very, very different types of student um, teacher relationships. And uh, you can sort of hear, th think about Vigo as being. Um, a teacher and Croce is sort of reading him, trying to call ideas and sort of like being a student. And then I also thought about um, uh, Harold Bloom's The Anxiety of Influence, yeah. which is um, his idea is basically that every great, well, he says poet, but I think you could expand it to artist or thinker even, um, uh, wrestles with their uh, their contemporaries and and the people who have come before them and their greatness is achieved in large part by um, struggling with what they had to say and in some senses necessarily misinterpreting it. Mm -hmm. um, so those I think are two interesting sort of ideas to keep in mind as we, we think about the uh, what's going on here. So this is uh, Croce's trying to read Vico, and I think it's important about what Davout said about um, he really does have a, an intense admiration and, and admits throughout, you know, several of the pieces that he wrote early on in his life that he, he got his 
um, a lot of inspiration from Nico himself. But he has this really um, a knee jerk bad reaction towards one of the things that Vico tends to do, which is to draw or attempt to draw universal laws from uh, several disparate empirical observations, which is what happens in natural science all the time. Natural science is built around induction, right? We, we make observations of the universe, about the universe, and then we try to build laws and we just sort of assume that we have the best model until it's maybe contradicted. But um, Croce doesn't think you can do that with something that is as complex as a society or a civilization. Um, in fact, he doesn't even think you could do that with the physical sciences, which is a whole other discussion. But um, because society and civilization is ruled by a geist, a spirit, um, and I think it would be interesting also to talk about what in the geist or the spirit makes it uh, non law like. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that's another, maybe it's just humans are too complex to fall into, to, you know, to apply to, to historical laws. But uh, Vico applies those laws, sort of um, the, the, the recourse that we were talking about in, in the last lecture, the one before it, that you have this sort of um, stages that civilizations go through. And they're inexorable and in that all civilizations follow them. And um, the big observation I think that White is trying to say is that um, Croce is criticizing him for, um, for thinking that you can do that. Mm. That's where I would start. Mm -hmm. well, wonderful. I, I think it is important to note with Croce that he has an admiration for Vico, and I'm glad you brought up Harold Bloom's anxiety of influence, where there's also in that, um, with that idea of the anxiety of influence, where the student has to separate themselves enough from the influence to where they cannot be easily traced back to the influence so that they, um, their genius as seen as more pure. So there can be this kind of disownering. But you want to have to get, one has to give cro uh, credit to Croce that he doesn't say straight up lambast uh, Vico, that he does in fact acknowledge him as an inspiration as opposed to this uh, game of say other some of the poets that Bloom talks about where they just straight up hate whoever their biggest influence is and totally disowns them in order to really um, show what a genius they are and you know Crochet I, I think he wrote a book on aesthetics he, you know Crochet is someone that seems to like he has that book on aesthetics I think he has one that really focuses on history then he has obviously this whole thing is on the philosophy of spirit. so he has these really neat categories um, he tries to have neater categories although I do I think there's a section in aesthetics on logic and it's kind of interesting how he works that but generally he also you know you mentioned some of the things he does like a Vico there's this sense of a determinism that has to go a certain way. And then also um, Vico for, for Croce, he can blur categories, right? You know, he can blur philosophy and science and history. And he's like, ah, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, what, what I think is, is critical here, and I think White is correct that um, Croce is crit criticizing um, Vico in terms of his system where you can make those, those splits. If we, in fact, follow Vico, that whatever um, humans create, you, the only things we can know is what we can create, then the, the human subject is, the human subjectivity is naturally something that blurs. All these different categories right like where we deal with objects that can be understood inside you know as i am holding this pen this pen can be understood in terms of um its facticity but it can also be understood in terms of my relationship to it it can be understood in terms of how i interpret it so there's this flow that you can move when you're dealing with the subjectivity between these different things and very often like we mentioned last time on vico there's the development of the it's the understanding of how the subject the subjectivity the consciousness develops through history and understands its world and gradually moves in the direction from the age of gods if we go toward the aims of enlightenment more and more into terms of um, rationality which then can unintentionally have an undermining mining um impact deconstructional impact on the on the human person in the society at large and you can generally understand that in terms of the one-to-one -one relationship between the signifier and the signified then that split between the signified and signifier as we're talking about the light and bolt and then they turn on one another and there's a deconstructional relationship so you have that development of how subjectivity and then you blow that up onto the collective consciousness um level and that's something that Vic was very interested in because he really wants to focus on how that's something that we can get true knowledge about because the human subjectivity is uh, something that we create as we live. It is something that we're actually encountering and can we understand and we can focus on that. But the moment you do that, the moment you make following that development your main focus, there is going to be these blurring of the categories because you're always going to be asking what is the, what is the experience of the lightning bolt 
for consciousness? How does that impact consciousness? What is, so what is, you have a fact of a lightning bolt and you have a certain split of the signifier and the signifier. But you see, this presents uh, to me kind of an interesting question because the other thing um, Croce goes after Vico is, uh, you know, he, he kind of like, you know, Vico moves between his, this history, this ideal history that he thinks civilization falls into and the empirical facts of what actually happened in, in those societies. And so Vico picks and chooses whatever fits his arc and ignores all the other data. Now we've learned from Mr. White that all historians to some degree have to do this, right? I mean, no, you don't ever have, um, unless it's a chronicle is the term, right? The moment you get a history book, there's going to be some things you're organizing and some things you're focusing on. So that's, um, so that's inevitable that there'd be some organization. But I think it does to me, as I'm reading Crochet, like that critique of Crochet, it brings to question the mind, do I, Daniel L. Garner, literally think that there was a lightning bolt that a primitive people heard and that they thought it was a voice and that was the beginning of the split of the signifier and the signified. You know, do we really think that that was what occurred? Or when I think, when I read that from Vico and go, man, that's a really interesting idea. What am I really interested in? Well, it's more like this idea that civilization develops because of a split between the signifier and the signified, that now it's possible for the lightning bolt to be like a voice, that that's a transformation in language and thus the poetic, poetic imagination and that goes forth and then civilization develops um, develops as, as we go on. And I go, well, of course, it's more that do I actually, does, does Vico really have evidence that it was a lightning bolt that started all this? Or is that, or is that narrative, that story of the lightning bolt trying to point to a development of the poetic imagination that seems more true, that seems like there's some more truth to it. And we say, well, it, it would be the latter. And I think we have to ask ourselves, and I think this is a critique, it just opens up to me on, a lot of things. You can get into economics, all, all the soft science, all these different developments. Um, the question of what, what does one judge, on what terms do you judge Vico on? The idea that the lightning bolt story is pointing to, that seems pretty brilliant. I mean, my gosh, in that his period of time to be thinking about the formation of societies in terms of the poetic imagination, that's an extraordinary step that can, can impact the direction people think on. Or are we going to judge him and say, well, he doesn't really have proof about that lightning bolt thing. So, you know, we're going to throw out Vico. Like there's this, this question that kind of emerges on what, by what standard do you hold a thinker to that I think also it just kind of opens up for me. So those, those were some, uh, you know, reading this criticism of, of Vico, uh, there's some thoughts that were opening up with Croce. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think we can connect that back to the, the crit criticism and the difference of styles in uh, be between Vico and Croce. You talked about, uh, like we we discussed in the previous uh, session, the the phenomenon of a thunder or lightning, and then the understanding of it or in interpreting it, and that was uh, discussed inter with reference to a poetic logic by Vico. And here we can, uh, if you apply that distinction, and talk about the historical phenomena, the actual event, the so-called actual event, the thing in itself. And then the understanding of it, the interpretation of it, uh, that is discussed by Vico. But I think now uh, Crochet's criticism is that, stop, we, we cannot really talk about history in itself. We cannot, uh, we cannot have a philosophy. So what he is um, kind of allergic to, what he is, his red flag is raised when, whenever philosophers want to talk about historical determinism, a philosophy of history that kind of wants to capture the essence of history and make it philosophical, make his, his historiography subservient to a philosophical projects. And- um, Which is really ironic because uh, I think he lists as, uh, White lists as one of Croce's biggest influences, Hegel. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Who um, is a bit of a synthesizer, I would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the boundaries, um, I think that, Crochet wants to maintain these strict boundaries between the philosophical domain, the historical domain, and the empirical domain. And he says that we cannot cross these boundaries. And uh, so his, uh, his advocacy of what he's, called, what he's calling theory of history, uh, as opposed to a philosophy of history, and how that leads to history um, kind of striving to meet the standards that are aesthetics. Uh, aesthetic standards. So how should we judge the work of a historian? We should judge the work of a historian not based on some actual events that we can see in an unmediated way, but instead based on some aesthetic um, criteria. Um, so that's a little bit like that opens up its own problems. 
uh, these uh, strict boundaries are as difficult to maintain. Um, another boundary that Crochet is using is uh, constantly, he says he goes on to every work and wants to identify what is living in it and what is dead. <laughs> so that, that to me is itself a question. How do we identify something that is alive, something that is, what, what, what does it mean to say that parts of a work of history are alive? Yeah, that's um, my thoughts are not very organized, but I also want to touch on the, the criticism of Crochet being itself influenced by Vico. And uh, that is echoed in Hayden White's own criticism of Crochet. And so it, in the title of this essay, we have Hayden White kind of paying homage to Crochet by saying, what is living and what is, what is uh, so my style of criticizing Crochet is going to be going to take the form and use the language of Crochet's work just like how Crochet's criticism is going to take up and use the conceptual tools of uh, Vico about the poetic logic and the epistemological questions about history. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, if, if there's a question to, for us to raise and respond to is, um, I'm not sure who raised this, but I think it was Daniel, the idea of Geist, um, why it is not, yeah, John, <laughs> the, why is it that Geist or the spirit is not, uh, cannot be subject to uh, a kind of lawful investigation, investigation that aims to uncover laws? Yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Well, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, I, he even says it about the natural sciences too. He seems to be very um, cynical about natural scientists saying that whatever inductive principles that they gather um, and content that they're only um, suitable towards a certain end and the extent to which they carry on being used after that end is just a, just, just um, a symbol of man's, uh, you know, uh, wanting to, uh, to uh, predict the future. It's interesting that, um, that Croce wrote, or is, is, is quoted by White from, from his book, Aesthetica, which, and I, th I think it might be kind of an irreducibly aesthetic difference in kinds of thinking about historiography. I mean, it might just be a, an irreducibly methodological mm -hmm. difference between them. Um, you know, um, one of them is a fox and the other one's a hedgehog. Mm -hmm. One of them sees one big picture. Um, that's clearly Vico. And uh, Croce is... Uh, more interested in maintaining finer distinctions between things and get sort of riled up when those distinctions are melded into one totalizing, synthesizing vision. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the, the shapes of the shapes of people's thought um, come in a variety of, of different ways that that might just be one of the things that he he can't really reconcile himself to, despite how much inspiration he gets from uh, other aspects of his of his ideas. One more thing, sorry, Daniel. No. Uh, we all we remember doing these uh, solving these uh, Newtonian physics problems uh, that kind of uh, they are in an imagined, idealized world that doesn't really correspond to to, to reality because friction is removed. Uh, all the other like everything that is irrelevant to those forces that we are trying to uh, include in the problem, and if something similar to those idealized events happen in the, our actual environment. Uh, and we don't see the, rep, the, the, the ideal situation being repeated. We do not, uh, we don't say, oh, something is wrong with reality because we, we realize that the reality, uh, in reality, those ideal uh, types, the, 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 the idealized situation in which it, all the irrelevant extraneous factors are removed, mm -hmm. uh, they don't happen. So. That's, that's, I think, the reason why Vico sometimes looks at an empirical fact and then rejects it and says, okay, despite the, despite the fact that the phenomena doesn't uh, match my theory, I'm going to take side with my theory because in this case, maybe some extraneous factors are contaminating the phenomena. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, uh, well, one of the questions I always wonder about, is it possible to have a conclusion that doesn't have uh, potential philosophical implications and thus could be called a philosophical 
uh, you know, you're using history for philosophy. You know, for example, uh, you know, I really like um, Homo Hirogatis by Louis de Mon, where he studies the Hindu caste system, and at the end he comes up with this conclusion where he says, you know, I don't think we can um, understand the origins of the caste systems in terms of uh, the British Empire. It looks like it was pre-existing, even if the British came in and solidified the caste system in order to control India through the Brahmin class. It looks like there was pre-existing. Therefore, it would su suggest that human nature is hierarchical. Okay, is that a philosophical conclusion? Is that an anthropological conclusion? That has philosophical implications uh, because if humans are naturally hierarchical, that says something about the consciousness and what is a hierarchy, we get into philosophical questions, right? So you could accuse Louis de Mond at the end of that book of doing philosophy, of using, um, soci you know, studying people groups to have philosophical conclusions. If we say, okay, um, you know, we go to a political science book, like What's Wrong with Kansas, where we say it looks like the Kansas is always voting against their interest and voting for the conservative party when their workers and the liberals would give them certain benefits. So what's wrong with Kansas? And we say, well, it looks like Noam Chomsky, you know, comes in with manufacturing consent. And he says, well, because um, conservatives are really good at uh, controlling media outlets and making people vote against their own interests and, and so forth and so on. Um, it, does that have, is that true? One, is that completely true? Uh, you know, because someone like Alan Brooks would go, goes and interviews people in Kansas and the people say, well, we, we vote conservative because we think it's immoral to take money from the rich, even if it would maybe economically make sense, you know, and other, you know, but they say, well, maybe they only think that because, you know, uh, consent has been manufactured through Fox News or whatever, right? Maybe 30% of people, it's what Brooks is saying and the other 70% is what Comsky is saying, right? Are we going to throw out all of Comsky because there's 30% of people that doesn't fall into that model? Or do we say, well, there's some truth? And both of those could be argued to be have philosophical implications because what is what are human beings like that they're going to put their maybe their moral code ahead of their economic interests or what is the human consciousness like to be so easily influenced by media right so that conclusion could be um you know uh, considered to have philosophical implications um but does that mean it's merely philosophical arguably freud lacan all these psychoanalysts they have philosophical ramifications but are they merely philosophical. So one of the problems I guess I have with Crochet's critique of when he's dividing one, the theory of history from the science of, of history is two, after, especially after, I think also where he's coming before Karl Popper, this is important. Basically like um, the science of history and the theory of history is kind of a false dichotomy because science always entails history and it's always falsification. And you can always, always it's always kind of dealing with probabilities at the end of the day, right? We want to talk about habits. I think part, you know, someone talked about habits of nature versus laws of nature and, and different things like that. So I think Crochet is operating on an earlier paradigm. And then second, a critique of Vico is using history in service of philosophy well, you can almost accuse anyone of doing that because any conclusions can be material for philosophical consideration. So I, I think you have to get into what, what it, I would almost want to ask Croce, you know, I'd almost want to ask him, what is a exclusively philosophical co conclusion, a conclusion that starts in philosophy, stays in philosophy, and ends in philosophy, as opposed to, say, start in political science and then end up in philosophy because it has philosophical ramifications or a philosophical conclusion that didn't go off into economics because your theory of human motivation has an impact on if socialism or capitalism works, right? So I'm, I'm not, that, that cr critique um, for me of accusing Vico of using history in service of a philosophical project. Now, a more valid, I think you, you can always, I guess, it's just an easy thing to say. Now, again, I have a soft spot for, we were talking, you know, about um, noble savages and states of nature. I have a soft spot for people critiquing thought experiments that are used to justify a certain a uh, governmental or colonial program, or even a critique of a veil of ignorance for Rawls or the Rousseau or any of these different people. I have a, I have a, a soft spot for that, but I don't know if I want to accuse Vico of being equivalent to Rousseau talking about a state of nature where things were perfect and using that as a foundation for axioms. Um, it seems like it would be interesting to, I, you know, I, I might continue that thought on the differences between what, say, a Hobbes or a Rousseau is doing or a John Rawls and what Vico is doing, because I don't think those are equivalent. And I almost feel like in Crochet, there is a um, kind of a, an equivalence between those two um, activities. That was that was a and I, and I don't think they're quite the same, but I, I feel like that they're being um, called equivalent. One big difference, I think, between Vico and Crochet is their, the way they approach the future. So mm. for Vico, learning about history and, it, and education in history and philosophical treatment of history has something to say about the future, sure. uh, especially with regard to recourses and re re recurrences. But uh, Crochet is very adamant that 
is a kind of adopting a kind of quietism with respect to the future. It's like all we can talk about, kind of like artists, the art, uh, the, the, the kind of artist, artistic generations and artistic creations have happened so far. We can see them, we can comment on them, we can uh, have, we can philosophize about them, but it doesn't predict what is going to happen now from the present moment uh, up to the, so he, history, I think for him would say, uh, would just give us an appreciation of things that have happened up to now and the future is open. And maybe it would allow us to approach the future and, and the present with that openness. So it, it has an existential uh, kind of attitude in it, uh, I think. No, I, and just to add, no, I think that's correct. I think there's a notion that Vico is talking about science, like a science as in this is how things unfold. It's much more determinism. Even, even um, where Hegel, I think, is much less deterministic, even though there's this idea, I, I think that's where he's inspired. There seems to be influence from Vico, but there's also distinction. Where in Hegel, there is a notion that if history is progress is going forward, it is progressing, but it is not necessarily the case that history is going to continue. That's a weird distinction. So if, if history continues in Hegel, it's going to get better, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to continue. Because in fact, as history progresses, we, um, well, like take right now, right? If we don't nuke, you know, if we don't blow everyone up, well, yeah, we'll have the internet and, you know, th things arguably will get better and, unless meta is not good. I don't know. You see, we can, I'm not saying Hegel, we can complexify it, but there is this raising, we mentioned it before, this raising of the stakes in Hegel, where there is a, if things continue, they will progress, but they do not necessarily continue. Um, so it's this kind of blur of contingency and progress, which um, I, I, I think that's a fair critique. Again, it's one of those things when I was reading this, like, is, you know, it does, and I'm trying to think back on the new science. Yeah, I guess there is a little more determinism in Vigo. So I do think there, it's, it's a fair critique because it does make me just think back on this question of when we say there is truth to Vico, like, what are we saying? In the same way that if we go, there's truth to Freud, do we really think that children, you know, that sons want to kill their dads? Do we really think that? You know, or is it something, it's like, it's, yeah, there's something to that, but it's not literal, right? It's like, it's not literal, but it's true. Maybe it's true. I mean, you know, I've heard my son say he wants to marry my, you know, Michelle, I've heard that. So, there, you know, there's some like flashes of some sort of truth. Or when we read Homo Herga, or, you know, I mentioned Mo Noam Chomsky. Do we literally think that every single conservative pundit is part of a plot to brainwash people? Well, no, but it does seem as if there's some sort of manufacturing the consent truth. So what so what exactly when you take these sort of books, mm -hmm. what is the truth? What exactly is it's like, you know, it's like the, I think we've mentioned it before the box line, you know, all all models are wrong, but some are useful. You know, it's that kind of phrase. So are these are models. And then if that's the case, if what we're reading, like this book with Foucault is more so a model, then what are what are we as readers doing when we say we like it? that we think there's truth to it or that we critique it because you can always critique a model because of course all models are wrong, right? So what, what's going on in the act of reading? It, it makes me reflect on that. When you read Vico, when you read um, Lacan or when you read Hegel, not many people talk about Hegel wrote all those books, you know, the history, he wrote history, right? We don't throw out Hegel because we go, there's a, mm, some of those factual uh, details in Hegel's history or David Hume's history on England. We don't throw them all out. So, so what are we doing as readers? When we say we like her an idea or we think that there's truth to this idea, kind of, to me, opens up that question. I, I also want to just rule out that we, we don't mean when we say a model is useful, we don't just mean that um, like practical side of you're not no, just no, 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 yeah, absolutely, that, absolutely. That it helps right. us predict certain things that we don't right. we know it is not. useful is not a narrow pragmatism right. exactly. in that context. Yes, exactly. So by useful, we also mean that it provides us with a reference point in our thinking. Yes. So I have Freud now and I can just jump to Freud's position and from Freud's position, I can jump to somewhere else. Uh, I can find a new, um, a new way of thinking about the psychoanalytic situation because Freud kind of allows us to go to that Freudian position and then look, uh, look at different things. Uh, from that perspective. Right. No, well, I like the language of reference because that seems to be part of it, right? Where you can go, okay, well, boom, I can reference Vico, think of this idea of the only thing that we can know is the created, and that becomes a useful reference for, for opening up horizons of thinking. Mm -hmm. Am I going to go, oh, well, I'm not going to use that mental model or reference point or whatever. Am I not going to use that because I, he doesn't have any hard evidence that there was a lightning bolt? Does, you know, am I going to, am I going to throw him out? Because uh, I feel like, because, and I think, um, it, it's just so easy if you want to like get a book published to just criticize, you know, like um, 
you know, obviously to lose a guitar, I make a, make a career out of attacking Hegel and, and Freud. And, and it's like, well, you always have space to do that uh, because there always is going to be this um, lack of precision that is almost necessary when you're dealing with big questions or big descriptions that you're trying to, to go through. Um, and I think, I find it too, I think it's kind of just healthy as readers to just not do that kind of I even thinkers I don't like I try to go oh well let me assume they're correct let me assume that there's something to this as opposed to go in as a reader tearing it apart not that I don't want to accuse Crochet you know I don't want to accuse him of doing that because I think he's he like we said he loves and respects Vico but it it, it brings up that question of how to read a book I guess mm. it, it really does like when you talk about the theory of history and the science of history I mean I can think of like when you go back oh gosh on the Pel whoever wrote the kind of the Greek history books and the Peloponnesian War um, all these different kind of Greek where there was more of a blurring of the different categories of thinking and, and it does feel more literary and there is something about Vico that feels more um literary as you read it um now I would on if I'm taking uh Croce's side there is something to be said um when you have these distinctions of categories you can have more dialectic relation between those categories and those can actually give rise to new possibilities like when you have them all blurred together um it seems like you need to have this ability to pull them apart think of them independently have them dialectically relate but then also put that them back together like there seems to be these are these different mental acts that are quite important like you it is impossible for me just sitting in this room to think about every single object in this room at one time right by definition i have to first focus on the bookshelf then focus on the wall you know i cannot you can't even think about a room actually simultaneously or every detail of the room, right? The, the, na the nature of the mind to comprehend something has to divide and split apart, right? If you're going to get a good grasp on it. And yet, if I were to then treat the room as if it was merely the bookcase, there would be a, a radical reductionism that would take place, right? Because the, book pay, the bookcase is an element of the room. Well, so it goes with knowledge, right? I may have to, in fact, just focus on inflation rates or the CPI or economics or something in order to get a really good grasp on it. But, but the issue is, if I really want to get the full human experience or I want to talk about what economics does to the individual in a certain way of life or trying to decide if they're going to buy a car and how that affects their work life and so on and so forth. And then if they can't afford a car, how they're looking for explanation. And then they turn on the television and they're therefore more susceptible to the manufacturing of consent. Oh, that you've discussed the economic conditions that then have put them in a certain emotional state that then makes them susceptible to the stuff Noam Chomsky is talking about. Ah, well, then we can start to see a sort of chain, but you have to put them together in order to get to that chain of effect. Oh, but here's the thing. Maybe that chain of effect would describe how 50 people in Kansas came to fall under the sway of manufactured consent, but maybe there's a, a, another hundred fall under explanation B, another a different chain in effect, and then another hundred explanation C and D and so forth. And therefore the model, the first model I described, maybe that only um, describes 3% of Kansas. And yet relative to that 3%, it might be true. Are we gonna then turn around and say, oh, well, the book that described that cause and effect is useless or it's false because I can find, um, because the other 97% of people aren't explained that way? Well, no, there's some valuable knowledge. There's some valuable truth in that kind of cause and effect that you can have described, even if it only applies to 3% of people. And I think what can happen sometimes is we start to go, it's, we can always say, well, this, the model only describes 3% of people, therefore it's not a good model or something like that. When really you almost as a reader have to go, oh, I can see how that's a possibility. I can see how that has some maybe narrow, maybe not wide. You almost have to get into like narrow explanation as opposed to wide explanation. I can see where that would have narrow use. And therefore, I'm not going to accuse this um, writer who wrote the book making that argument as being wrong or stupid because it does in fact make sense that it could hold, is internally consistent, and it probably does describe some percent of people's um, lived experience, right? Well, likewise, the, it, even if there was no lightning bolt, the and maybe maybe only you know maybe only forty percent of Vico's. I'm just making up numbers. Vico's his you know historical facts are accurate, but it is possible. It is very plausible that the division between the signifier and the signified had a massive impact on the social orders that formed, even if the details of how that split occurred and how it then unfolded in history are not 100% correct, maybe they're only 30% correct. That is that idea that the split between the signifier and the signified impacted the collective consciousness seems plausibly like a good idea and would in fact impact the civilizations that formed. So we therefore say, okay, well, Vico is 
adding value. There is something here that is important. And we are not going to therefore say that Vico is, is useless um, or that there's nothing there's nothing there. Um, so you almost have to get into charitable reading or just knowing how to read a book, like just knowing how to read, like um, not, not just throwing stuff out. I think it's so easy to get in the habit of throwing stuff out because you say, oh, that only applies to 3% of people as opposed to 97% of people or, oh, Vico got 40% of his historic facts wrong. Therefore, there can't be any truth to the idea that the split between the signifier and the signified impacts people. Or you could do that with Freud, right? I mean, it's the same, you know, it's the same, or the psychoanalysis, young, or, ex, you know, et cetera, and so forth. Um, but but I, think, I, just, I think if we as readers make that mistake, we're the ones who suffer for it, actually. You know, we miss out on those possible expansions of horizons and the new ideas that, that could emerge from taking, taking those nuggets seriously. It's quite interesting that the, the the exception and the rule, they don't, these two concepts don't correspond to the, the small and the large. Mm. So what ends up being labeled as the rule and what ends up being labeled as the exception are the results of um, not the amount of phenomena that we, we can, uh, we are observing, but how much of the phenomena are according to the things that we can make sense of. So mm. as you said, if we can make sense of 3% th of what we observe, then 97% of what we observe are labeled as exceptions. And this is why uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, again, to, to, to uh, give credit to him, the notion of black swan is, uh, refers to this, that the highly consequential, extremely important, significant events are called exceptions, even though they determine almost everything, yeah. every part of our, uh, our world. Oh no, it, it's uh, and and you know he also talks about how we get swimming. You know we're scared of getting on planes, but the chances of dying on a plane is not very high. But we buy swimming pools when swimming pools all the time. We're very very bad at determining. You know what are things we should be concerned about? What are the big we under appreciate these um, perhaps rare but highly impactful events that can change. And you can think about it, like US foreign policy because of 9-11 uh, changes for a very long time. The 2008 financial crisis occurs and they mention it every single day on CNBC, right? You know, they're talking about it all the time. It mm -hmm. has this massive um, impact. And so again, I think that kind of feeds into, if you really do understand how bad you are at judging uh, what I, a judgment in general of these of these events or what's good or not, you become more charitable as a reader. Um, you can go, okay, well, maybe Vico is only three percent right, you know, if you and what he's saying, but that three percent that he's right about could radically impact all of civilization or could radically impact the world. I mean, it's the same thing you could play with like any great, you know, it, like someone like Marx, right? You can go through and say, I don't know about his um, theory of value. Uh, you know, I feel like the material dialectic is incomplete. I'm not sure, but you know, that notion of the alienation that is a result of working a job that is not yours and you, that you feel like it, and that creates a certain existential tension that can lead to an undermining of the system. That seems important that might have really big impacts on the entire socioeconomic system, even if we don't follow some of these, these other notions that you find in Marx, for example, right? So that just makes you more charitable because you start to go, you, you stop thinking in terms of what percentage of Marx is correct or Vico is correct. And you start going, are there ideas, you know, one, that's, that's a factor you can consider, but you also go, well, are there ideas here that are actually very impactful, that really, really matter? And if you have a thinker that achieves some of those, then you say, well, th this is a great thinker, even if you go, well, maybe maybe they, they, they got other things incorrect. All those lawful recurrences of history end up being uh, exceptions and things that probably will never happen in, in the ecosystem if we are living in a Christian society, Christian civilization. So the whole civilization, the whole context in which somebody's coming up with the, uh, historical determinism becomes the exception. Mm -hmm. But still, that, the historic, that philosophy of history becomes uh, is, is important for identifying the status of the current society as an exception, as a deviation from that, uh, that law. Absolutely. Um, any final words? <laughs> uh, I'm okay. <laughs> cool. Till next time. All right. Yeah. Take care.